John, the gospel according to St. John, chapter 17, from verse 20 to 26. I welcome you all in Jesus' name, and I ask that at the end of the service, I'll be inviting the faithful to share in the communion of the Lord, and then uh, after that, we'll have our fellowship meal today. John 17, from verse 20 to 26, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me, me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, let me at the throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Standing here before your people, in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Who do we have on earth beside you? Or in heaven beside you? We have come as needy people. The rich, the poor, the have and the have not, the literate and the illiterate, all standing in awe of your majesty this morning. It is a great thing to be subservient to the almighty God, to your sovereignty. We come recognizing that you are the fountain of life and from you we draw our essence, our existence, and even our very life. Your word is truth. Sanctify your people now through the preaching of your word. Take my lips of clay and use it to the intent that we may live here glorifying your name that you've come through for us. May your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please may you return back to your seats. All my friends that had birthdays this past week, uh, a warm birthday greetings to you. At the end of the service, we'll be praying for uh, Victor, we'll be praying for Brother Bukola, and we'll be praying for Brother Felix, who uh, also for their wedding uh, anniversary. Okay. And all of you who have come for the first time to this church, uh, a warm welcome to you. My name is Pastor Peter Joshua Abutu, or Abutu Peter Joshua. You can arrange them the way you want to arrange them. It's still fine. I'm the missionary pastor of this local assembly, and I trust that the Lord will use me these few moments 
for your edification and for your confirmation. The book of John, uh, I have been in it doing some series through it. And we are now in chapter 17. And this chunk that we have read this morning is the last uh, of chapter 17. John chapter 17 is the prayer of Jesus. Uh, the night penultimate, uh, the night before he was arrested, the night before he faced, uh, he faced his uh, uh, passion. And he, this is one of the wonderful moments that God allowed us to have a glimpse of what it looked like that the second person of the Godhead is interacting with God the Father. It is, it is one of the most wonderful pieces of, of accounts in the entire gospel. We have learned a lot of lessons and we continue to learn lessons from uh, the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. Towards the end of our, of our preaching last week, look at particular verse 19, Jesus said, um, for their sake I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. You see, the idea of consecration, time failed me last week to, to get there. Uh, what Jesus was saying uh, in verse 19, before we pick it up from verse 20, is the, 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 the picture of the high priest uh, sanctifying himself as he offered the sacrifice on the day of atonement. The truth that is pointed out here is that Jesus is both the offering and the, uh, the high priest making the sacrifice. In the cross of Christ, we see Jesus being both the offering and the offerer. He offered himself as a worthy atoning sacrifice to God. He is both the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world and he is both the high priest conducting the sacrifice to God. I just want to mention that by way of passing for those who have been following the reading in this uh, passage. Uh, for, for, for the portion that we are looking at today, there are three things I want to bring to our notice and our learning this morning. It is that we learn from the prayer of Jesus the conduit of the gospel, I mean the conduit, like the conductor, I mean the conduit, the pipe, the channel uh, by which the gospel came to us, the conduit of the gospel. And the second thing I want us to learn also is the coordinate of the gospel, the coordinate of the gospel, and then the centerpiece of the gospel. From verse 20, where we read, the Bible said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Jesus has been praying for himself in the first part of chapter 17. He prayed for himself, and he also prayed for the immediate follower, the disciples. At this point, the 11, Judas have been expelled from the community, the, the band of the apostles, the 12, and the 11 were with him. So he committed them to the hands of the Lord in his prayer. And then picking up from verse 20, he turned the prayer now to the, the rest of us that will come to faith in the future through the ministry of the apostles. My friends, the apostles were not just regular Christians. They were hand-picked by Jesus to be his witnesses, the witnesses to his resurrection. To the extent that what they will say after Jesus' departure will be the word of Jesus and invariably their own very words. That when we hear the apostles speaking to us, we, we understand that they are speaking the word of Jesus not their own word in and of itself. 
but they were so united with Christ that Jesus was and their world become inseparable. The apostles were the authorized channel by which the gospel of salvation will come to the world. It is divinely given that the apostle be the only authentic channel by which the gospel message will reach the world and to the ends of the world. Now, many of you are familiar with spokesmen. You know, if if something is happening in the villa, and then one random person just pick it up and is relating that message to the public, we will not, we will not believe it. We will take that with a pinch of salt. But if Garbashehu, yes, Garbashehu, yes, or Femi, or Shehu Garba, or Femi Adishina, comes up and then they speak, we know this is the official voice of the president or the presidency, if you understand my drift. So the apostles were the only channel by which the gospel of Christ will be preached to the world. The gospel as delivered by the apostle is the authentic gospel. Every other entity that purports to put the words of Jesus in their mouth to speak. Of course, there were many of them in the New Testament. There were pseudo apostles. There were uh, there were there were imposters that purport to speak. In fact, Paul called them in Galatians some super uh, super apostles. Uh, they were moving around preaching what they ought not to preach. They were liars. The apostles and their works delivered to us the authentic. Gospel. We learn from this prayer that these apostles will be the channel by which God brings the gospel of Christ to us. And just to support this very quickly, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, and also Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. First Corinthians 15, now I will remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas, or to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep continuing. Turn to Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 8. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. What it means is that it is not the angel that the gospel were committed to. It is the apostles. There were 11 at this point. Later, uh, one person was added in the book of Acts. Was it Judas or Matthias? Matthias. And then Paul was also added in due season. These were the official channel that the gospel came to us. That's not Angel Gabriel. So that's when you go to some congregation and then you are seeing Angel Gabriel, Angel Gabriel, Angel Gabriel shaking them. They are out of order. The church of the living God is apostolic. It is the apostolic messages that we have as the New Testament. The four gospels that we read today were not written by Jesus Christ. I hope you understand that. And the remaining epistles that were written were written 
by the apostle or their immediate associates. The conduit by which the gospel came to us is the apostle. And what is the gospel? The gospel, as we, 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 we have read, is that Christ came as God incarnate. And he came as a propitiation for the sins of the world, as a peacemaking offering, and also as an atoning sacrifice. He is 100% God and 100% man. 100% God so that he can be a perfect sacrifice without blemish. 100% man so that he can be a worthy representative of humanity as our kinsman redeemer. If he is not human, he is not worthy to represent us bearing our sin as a scapegoat. It was necessary for him to be human so that he share in our estate. So the blood that flew or that flows in his vein were not pseudo or phony blood. The blood that was flowing in the vein of Jesus is not the kind of blood that flows in the veins of a cyborg. It was real hemoglobin that if you will take Jesus to the laboratory and you, you take out his blood for analysis, it will correspond in all of the properties that human blood will have. The only thing that will be absent is that he is without sin for he was conceived immaculate. Of course, you don't go to the lab to diagnose sin. But he was a proper man. Not 50% 50, 50 man or 50% supernatural. He was 100% man. And if anyone does not believe in the humanity of Christ, he is an heretic. But he, he was and he is 100% God. God in the flesh. So that he can be a perfect offering for sin. So he came here, lived and died. And really died. When we read Apostle, uh, the Apostles' Creed, that is what is it. Because that, that has been the challenge from the beginning of church history. And he died. That was the apostles were saying. And he died. He really, really died. He didn't faint as some branch of Islam would teach. There was no fainting on the cross. It was not revived later. He really, really died. His mystery all, the immortal, dies. And who can phantom this? Great design. And then he was buried. And on the third day, regardless of your calculation, the Bible says on the third day, he rose bodily, not as a ghost, bodily, but now with resurrection body. The body that can walk through walls without uh, obstruction. And then he ascended to heaven and now is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for believers according to the will of God. And that because he was sinless, his obedience, both his active and passive obedience, uh, were not for him primarily that his obedience, his active obedience, his obedience and compliance to the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and his submission to the will of God to be crushed on the three were for the believers, the elect. That God will have taken the benefit of his work, his cross, and has given to Christians as an imputative righteousness. That the righteousness that we never had because of our association with Adam, God not took 
the alien, what Martin Luther called the alien righteousness, the righteousness apart from the law, and then he applies that to the heart of the believer. Those who will come to him by faith. That is the gospel. That is the good news. It had nothing to do at its roots with human well-being like wealth, prosperity, riches, health. At its root is God in Christ Jesus reconciling sinners back to himself. That is the gospel. God pardoning people's sin, those who deserve hell. God saving them in Christ. That whoever will come to him by faith receive pardon from God, both for the original sin and the actual sin. The conduits of the gospel is the apostle. It is through the apostles that the gospel were preserved from error and the malice of Satan. It was through them they were special people. And we don't have apostle again. Amen. Amen. Of course, we have some with a small, small letter A. So that's another issue for another day. We, we, the apostles were they're selected by Christ. They were special. And they were witnesses. And you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to know the qualification for an apostle. To be an apostle, it means we have seen Jesus physically. We have seen the resurrected Christ with your two eyes. And if you are from Obama Shaw and you are an apostle, uh, we want to I want to ask you how, how, have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the Lord? Have you seen the Lord with, with the two eyes and uh, so if you seen something else and uh, you, should, you should question. And you can see that many other men that came through outside this group of apostles that are trying to preach the gospel, they were false. See. There were more. There, there were letters in the New Testament, like the Gospel according to Barnabas, the Gospel of uh, Judas, the Gospel of this. There were many Gospels. They failed the standard test. They failed. The, once there's no apostolic imprimatur, it's false. Once you appear in the New Testament, they ask you, "Are you from the apostles?" <laughs> if you are not from the apostles, they no, no, there's no. If the letter is received by the church, they ask, are they from the apostles? The reason you have this New Testament today, and we can call it authentic word of God, is that they came from the apostles. There are many books that Christians have written through the ages. Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, August, uh, uh, Bishop uh, August, Augustine of uh, Hippo, all those works, John Owen, John MacArthur, works. But they are not scriptures. The scripture, the gospel came to you by the apostles. They are the conduit. They were the, they were the worthy conduit. They were the worthy, authentic, pure conduit by which the gospel came to us. The second thing is the coordinate of the gospel. I know some of you went to school. And then when I use the word coordinate, your mind will be running riot as to math and chemistry. I'm not going there, okay? Uh, tell me, I'm not talking about coordinates, okay? I'm not talking about two sets of whatever. Uh, I'm not talking about graph and the coordinate of the gospel. Uh, but the word coordinates, uh, the first use, the first meaning of the word coordinate, the dictionary meaning, the first dictionary meaning of the word coordinate is to bring different elements of a complex activity or organization into a harmonious or efficient relationship. Even these that I've just said now is difficult to understand. Anyway, the more simpler definition of the word coordinate is to arrange for things so that things all come together or to work with someone else to establish a common aim. So what I'm, what I'm driving at is that the, the things they are coordinates, the, 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 the principal property that bring everything, every component of the gospel together, 
that make the gospel work and the gospel presentation and the gospel life worth handling is unity. Look at verse 21 or John 17. Christ is praying for the disciples and all of us that there may be all one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all may be one and continue off to verse 23. Oneness, oneness. What Jesus is praying for is that, that the unity between the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, which is the substratum of other unity that must uh, exist between Christians may be, uh, may be felt among Christians that both we that will be believers 100 years or 1,000 years after the apostles will be of the same mind with the apostles. That the cross that the apostle preaches will be the cross that we will be preaching till the end of the age. That there will be no uh, different lay levels or color of Christ. There will be no black Christ. Of course, there are some movements now that talk about Christ being black. Okay, there will be no black Christ. There will be no American Christ. There will be no European Christ. There will be no African gospel. There will be no uh, emancipation gospel of Martin Luther King Jr. There will be no that all of us speak with one mind. Because the entirety of the gospel is Christ. That the same way the revelation of Christ came to the apostles, the same way they beheld his glory even imperfectly, we all will, in one accord, unite in that stream of understanding of Christ. So unity, unity. Uh, unity among Christians is primarily a spiritual unity. It's not so much about organizational unity. It is much more about a spiritual unity, a unity that circumferes around the person of Christ in all of his beauty and form. Unity. That we are saying the same thing. Of course, these also have ramification with our physical and organizational unity that uh, we, we unite around Christ, that when we come physically to come uh, in, in, in Christian association or in PFN or whatever organization or denomination we want to organize for our convenience, it should be that what is on the table is nothing more than Christ and the truth of Christ and the authentic Christ. Where and when Christ is lacking, Christian unity cannot be said to be present. Christ is the coordinate. The unity around Christ is the coordinate of the gospel. There is no association outside Christ. And let me just say by way of digression that Christians ought not to fear schisms and disunity. And sometimes say, oh no, why are we quarreling now? Are we not saying the same thing? I mean, come on. If you are just minimal about this, about that, okay, even if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, after all, who has gone there and come back? We are all going to the same place. Eh? Uh, is, it, is it that? Uh, so are you saying that your grandfather that died, that good man that died in, uh, 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 in the Baja, is, is he in hell? Is he in hell? Who has gone there and come back? Come on, just, just unite. Just unite, just unite, just unite. And then you see in our ecumenism, Strange, bad fellows. The unity that must exist amongst Christians is the unity that have Christ at its center. And thus that have his foundation in the unity in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are one. One God, three persons. The coordinate of the gospel is unity. And we must fight for the unity we should not be schisms by nature. We must fight for the unity of the body of Christ. And lastly, the centerpiece of the gospel. The centerpiece of the gospel, look at verse 24. Father, 
I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am and continuing and talk about the glory he shared and other stuff there. As this Paul says that our redemption is not primarily the reason uh, redemption is not primarily the reason for the gospel. It, it, our salvation is, that, is just a means to an end. Let me explain what it means. What it means is that we are not just, okay, we've been saved. So what? What he means by our salvation as a means to an end is that we have been saved so that we can be both in Christ and with Christ. Believers now, having been saved positionally, are in Christ, in what, we, what the Bible teach as union with Christ. We are in Christ. Spiritually, we are in Christ. We have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. We are one with Christ. And much more than that, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. But the ultimate, the goal of Christ's coming, the goal of him saving us, is that we will be with him. That when we lay down these mortal bodies, when they put us down six feet below the ground, we will immediately be in the presence of Christ. And our apostle Paul says, to be present, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That which is far much, 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 much better. The job of Christ is to come to redeem us and bring us back home to the Father. We were estranged fellows from our Father. We abandoned God in Adam. We, we forsook him. And Christ in his death and his work is bringing God's children back home. He wants us to be with him. But not just to be with him, but to behold his glory. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. That is the gospel, and that we will behold Christ's glory. You know, when he was here with us, we walked with him, we ate with him. Very few privileged guys saw the glimpse of his glory one time at the transfiguration. And when John, the beloved, was writing the book of Revelation, he was somewhere in the eyes of Patmos, and he saw Christ. He saw the glorified Christ with human eyes. He fell down as if he were a dead man. Oh, Lamb of God. See, when we behold Christ's glory on the last day, not just for a moment, but perpetually, we, we, will, we will not be tired. You know, there are some of you, let me know that example. Some of you, when you met your wife first time, you couldn't sleep. Hmm? You were doing extra cool, you were writing later. But over times now, hmm? what are the sisters saying? You are just, just watch what you are saying, eh? <laughs> Particularly you that you are not far from your husband. Just watch what you are saying. Don't call pastor to come and say to any. <laughs> you know, you know this beautiful, you know, you see the way men dance on their wedding day. But they are doing their 10 year anniversary and they are marching. The dance have changed. It speaks volume. Eh? See finish, isn't it? Yes. See finish. The person that will call you, you will call back. Make sure the phone is loaded with data. Make sure everything. See finish. See finish. 
you, you have complaints for everything now. Is it finished? But when we see Jesus forever and ever, beholding the glory of God as it is revealed on the sun, can never, never, never be satisfying. The more we look on him, the more we want to look on him. The purpose of, of redemption is that we, we are back home, beholding Christ. Be with him forever. Amen. That is it. If you don't have the desire in your heart, you are not yet saved. Let me just put that in front of you. If you are not waiting for Christ to come back, if you are not hungry, sometimes our, when, we, when we pray sometimes, we, I look at you. On one hand, you are saying, let it just come. On the other hand, you are saying, I shall not die. But live. Yes, sir. And some of you that are dating now, if I said, the Lord told me yesterday he's coming back in one week's time. And your wedding is in October. And then the Lord has told Pastor Butu that he's going to come back next week. What do you think will happen? Some people will say, in fact, one brother without thinking, say, Pastor, Beck, tell God, make it, make it just calm down. He says, he cannot be in my own, doing my own wedding. <laughs> Why didn't you come in your own wedding time? You see, you see how we think. How I wish on the day of Eliezer's wedding. Eh? <laughs> As he was carrying like this to put a, then the trumpet sound. You know, some of you would think that is wicked. But that would be worth it. Oh, that would be so much worth it. If both of them are saved immediately, they are with Christ. They will be missing nothing. Nothing. The conduit of the gospel is the apostle. This church is apostolic. The coordinate of the gospel is unity around Christ and his work. The centerpiece of the gospel is the glory of God, where we behold the glory of God in Christ, in heaven. Even right now, some of us are genuine Christians. We are beginning to see that glory, but darkly, in a glass. And our bodies are being transformed. And we are being worked into the image of Christ. And right now, there's a foretaste of heaven for those who are Christians. It's amazing. There is no carnal, there's no sin, sinful Christian. There's no carnal, I don't want to. Christians have tested the goodness of God. They have tested the beauty of the life to come. And they can't wait to have the fullness of that revelation. Amen. Amen. As I leave you today, some quick point of application. Guy, who is with the children? The first thing I want to leave you with is this. Is we should affirm the apostolicity of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is apostolic. Our name should have been CAC. You know, Christ Apostolic Church. I hope that one means, means something else. But what I'm saying is that it's apostolic. We stand on the shoulder of the apostles. We stand with them. Not the new apostles, not the emerging apostles. Apostles, the, the Bible ones. And if anyone, even if it's an angel, comes through this door and calls himself an apostle with a message that does not agree with that which we have received from the hand of the apostle, that person is lying to you. Even if he deviates by one degree, let me speak that. If a man come now with big, you know, this, there's a way this apostle look. If you don't know, get Levi, they fear them. They have cross on their, they have cross on their neck. I, I used to wonder, who, who, what is the point of a hanging cross on your neck? And then they have some weird looking people following them. Some people have bodyguard, now they have uh, bullet, bullet, uh, bulletproof. The man that is prophesying life over your life, his own bodyguard is wearing a. a b, 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 let, me not, let me not spoil your mind today. If a man comes through this door 
with wonders, with signs, with miracles. And all he's saying does not agree with the message that has been delivered to the apostles. That person is a liar. Do I need to repeat that again and again? Even if the signs are clear, even if what he says about your balance in the bank account was accurate, if his lifestyle and his preaching, the body of preaching that is delivering to you, does not accord with the apostolic teaching, he's lying. He's not from God. And if what he is saying accords with the apostles' teaching, his title is of is irrelevant. If he's repeating what the apostles are written in the Bible, what is the point? The church is apostolic. Secondly, we should be aware of Christian ecumenism. You now we have ecumenical center in the sense eh? you should be aware of ecumenism. <clears throat> Unhealthy ecumenism, if there's anything like that, is saying like this. We should not bother. We should not bother. We are once I believe in Jesus. It's okay. Let's come together. To do what? If someone says, I believe in Jesus, ask him, which Jesus? Tell me. Why do you think we ask Dodges to tell us how she became a Christian? Let us hear. If she, by when she was giving testimony, he said, actually, actually, I don't really know the Bible. Actually, I don't even go to church. One day, I was, uh, I was on my own in the Philly station. And then, there's a ghost that appeared from nowhere. And then the ghost lay out on me and say, oh, my daughter, today you are my prophetess. Go! Go and save the world. Go and make my people rich. Go! And then, from there, uh, I began to see visions. I began to see this. Uh -uh. There are sets of proposition that you must believe to be a Christian. If you don't believe them, if you don't understand them nor believe them, you cannot be a Christian. Our Christian unity should be around Christ. I can't have a quasi-Christian and on the same board working together. Can two work together unless they that is never, in fact, they are moving the frontiers now, what they call interfaith dialogue. And interfaith dialogue does have its benefit to a large extent, where people like Bishop Matthew Kuka, Sultan of Sokoto, will come together in one embrace. The reason why Bishop Matthew Kuka and Sultan of Sokoto can be in the same room, and then they will come out laughing, is that they don't speak. in that meeting, class was not on the table. It was how we can pacify our people, not to fight uh, each other, not how not to stuff ballot boxes, what we uh, how to balance our mutual uh, interest, how to respect each other. Do you know last Sunday or the two Sunday ago? And how a Muslim, and a Muslim man with cap who was in Equa Church in Zafara State with a microphone, because this is polit political uh, season now, and was saying, Praise the Lord. And the church answered, Hallelujah. They don't understand. Let any pastor walk into the mosque and say, Allah has to bear with his shoe on his feet. If that man will be out with his head intact on his shoulder, we don't understand. And I think it was Metama um, Sule that said, if two men who are diametrically opposed to each other went to the same room and they came out laughing, they have not spoken to themselves the truth. Truth divides. Oh, goodness. Truth divides. Show me a man that is upright in a society who will be a lonely man. Show me an upright man. Anytime truth is preached, men cannot endure truth. Truth is a sword. And the, the premier of, of old northern region should be Sa Ahmad, uh, 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 Sadana. Sadana said, truth is an open wound. It, 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 you know, it's a, uh, what is that? 
That's what they're using the daily trust. Uh, listen. He said, uh, he's talking about something that's an open, open wound. He said, only truth can heal it. He said, conscience, conscience. It's, an, yeah, it's, it's only truth that can heal it. Once a preacher begins to preach the truth, you can be so sure that there will be no many followers after him. The example was Christ. Christ was feeding them, healing them, feeding them, healing them. 5,000 people were following him. And one did not say, I am the bread that come from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live. If you don't eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no life in yourself. That's it. <laughs> okay. One after the other, the Lord Jesus, within seconds, was left alone. And the remaining eleven said, "You are you." Sister? Don't be ashamed to speak the truth. Say, so let's let's Catholic, the Catholic and evangelical together. Recently, I, I I was rebuked. I used to, you know, some of, as a Christian, I organized a meeting in my community. And I would say, let a Muslim pray, let a pagan pray, and then let a pastor pray. And one young man drew my attention. He said, Pastor, you are not being consistent. He said, let us have one prayer so that we will know that we have one prayer. He said, when you are praying three prayers together, what you are saying is that the three of them are of equal value. And the person is not, is not educated. It's in the village. Because sometimes it is not school that makes people wise. Eh? And as I close this service this morning, a few things. That because of this prayer of Jesus, we are here today. He prayed for the apostles, He prayed for us. We are here. God answered His prayer. We are the answer to, the, to Christ's prayer. The apostles brought the message to us and we are here today saved. Because of this prayer, the body of Christ remains united. Forget about the physical fight. We remain united. You can see from Paul to Peter to Clement to Origen to Augustine to, to Wycliffe to John Calvin to Jerome to Athanasius and so Martin Luther, to John Owen, all these men, to John MacArthur, to Pastor Conrad Mbewe, to Charles Spurgeon, all these guys have different shades of opinion about secondary matters, like infant baptism, and so forth and so on. But look at their works. They are organically together. Look back 2,000 years, you can see unity. There is a stream of authentic Christianity that remains undivided. You can't divide the body of Christ. It's indivisible. We may have physical fracas, but the body of Christ remains the same. We thank God for the intercession of Christ. It is the reason why the church will not die. It is the reason why you are still a Christian. He has prayed for you, and he's still praying for you. You know, sometimes we depend on people a lot to say, who is praying for you? Who is your prophet? And then we run around and look for our prophet. The best, the best prayer warrior can pray for you in his or her lifetime. What if he dies? And sometimes in church, say, brother, pray for me. Oh, I'm not feeling fine. Say, don't worry, we'll pray for you. Oh, bless you. 98% of time, they're not even praying for you. Because they have their own issues. The reason why you will survive, the reason why you will get to heaven is that Christ has prayed for you and is praying for you. And your faith will endure. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Christ died for me and that he died for me. Amen.